patalo vatu ile pa iman mamalo lo tato afia ile so famalo le afio matala amai uh, kiora kiorana malo ile le fakalo pala hiatu malo ni ni sambolo vinaka namaste and uh, many and very warm Pacific greetings to you all. Uh, it is my privilege to be presenting today with uh, Deborah um, from Levar, and uh, we will be um, aligning our presentation today. And uh, what I will be focusing on is on health professional training at Otago, Pacific health professional students, and cultural training and its relevance. The training of health professional students at Otago spans uh, throughout uh, New Zealand. So our students are spent throughout the whole from right from the south end in Macargo uh, right up to north in Whangarei. Uh, the university has four villages, as I call it, um, health sciences, science, commerce and humanities. And in the division of health sciences, um, is committed to strengthening Māori and Pacific health workforce. I'm very mindful of the time, so um, my apologies if I uh, speed up a little bit. I know you'd all like to have uh, morning tea. So one of the things um, that I ask myself at the university and at the Division of Health Sciences is what can we do to make a difference? And the way systems work, as in government and as in institutions, you have to have a plan and a framework in which to work by. So the Division of Health Sciences has a Pacific strategic framework. One of the goals is to demonstrate and value leadership on Pacific matters. And what this means is that it's not up to me to value leadership on Pacific matters. It is up to everyone in the division, right from uh, the Pro Vice Chancellor, who is my boss, to deans, associate deans, to staff, and everyone. There's a need to understand better how we do things, and, and therefore research is one of the very important things um, and the goals in the division. Effective community engagement. To be able to improve the performance of our students, we cannot do it without our community. And this is one of the things, one of my roles is to monitor the Pacific Strategic Framework and to keep the university true to its commitment. To enhance capability, and this is where we're working together with Lavar in terms of getting our students into health professional courses. We would love to have more of our students into health professional courses, and I'll talk about this later. We don't want all of you to be doctors and dentists. There are a lot of other health professional courses that we can get our young people into. Fourthly, the Pacific curriculum, and this is what I will be focusing on today. While we're trying to increase the number of our students into health professional courses, at the same time, there are thousands of others who are being trained to treat our communities. What that means is that 7% of our community, 7% of New Zealand population is Pacific. 2 to 3% of the nursing workforce in New Zealand are Pacific nurses, 1% are doctors, and even fewer in other courses. So it's most likely that our communities will see somebody who is not Pacific. And this is one of the passion that, is that I have, is that everybody who trains in health professional courses at the University of Otago has some exposure to cultural training in our communities. That's the last goal. This slide is very busy. But one of the commitment from um, the University of Otago, and I'm in the committee that decides who gets into the health professional courses, is to have, um, to train health professions that mirror the community, that mirror society. What this means is if you have a look at this, 15% of the total New Zealand population are Māori, 7.7% .7 are Pacific. But if you have a look, for example, at health professional student programs in Otago, this is Otago data, only 5% are Māori to 2.2% are Pacific. What we would like is to have the intake into health professional courses that mirrors society. Yeah? It's a very radical approach. 
So in all of the health professions in Dunedin, and the University of Otago is the largest provider of health education training in New Zealand, these are the number of students that it's currently training in the different health professional courses. With our own students, very small numbers, uh, we currently have um, just under 250 Pacific students who are training in different health courses at Otago. Having a look at this, the numbers are very small in medicine and dentistry. I just want to draw your attention to the Bachelor of Radiation Therapy. We only have one student there. We would love to have more. What is, what is radiation therapy? For those who have cancer, after treatment, um, having chemotherapy, you might then go on and have radi radiation therapy. About four years ago, I was diagnosed with breast cancer and I had treatment and I had fantastic service from the local hospital. What I would have loved to see is a Pacific face, yeah? So I would love to see many of our students. This is why I'm saying we can't all be doctors and nurses, but there are many other health courses that are available. And you know, in a, in a Bachelor of Radiation Therapy, you get paid in your second year. 22,000 untaxed. There are many, many courses that we would love to get you into, your children into, your students into. So I asked myself the question in Otago as Associate Dean, what is the role of health education institution in improving Pacific health? Firstly, is by increasing our Pacific health workforce. And then secondly, is the training and culture and competencies of all health professionals. We have, and this is for um, a training in health education, I did ask um, the head of the Teachers Training College in Dunedin, do you have any training or teaching in, in Pacific uh, culture? And the answer was very little, very minimum, or none in some areas. So this is the area I will focus on, and um, Debbie will talk on later about the Future That Works program and increasing the Pacific health workforce. So the cultural training in Pacific Health Professions at the University of Otago. There was a change in the curriculum in 2008 and it provided an opportunity for the development of the Pacific Immersion Program. And what that means is that students and all students in the fourth year of medical training spend a weekend with a local Pacific family. The, the objectives of the program is to experience Pacific family life in New Zealand to observe how culture, religion, and social economic environment influence health, to practice cross-cultural communication, to provide the opportunity for our community to teach students about their health and about things that influence us and that affect their health when they come to see them. And lastly, determine what could be helpful for them as health professionals when they're out there in the community. A number of things about getting this program underway, we needed to secure funding and we worked together with the local Pacific Trust in developing the program. It was piloted in 2010 with four Pacific groups and we worked together with our local community. So we had students, there were 80 students in the, in the um, fourth, year, uh, fourth year class, 20 of them um, stayed with the Samoan community, um, another 20 stayed with the Cook Islands then the Tongans, and then the mixture of small, uh, small ethnic groups. Uh, we had to get a registration and get our community leaders to engage with, uh, with their students. So the community leaders came and met with all of the students um, on the Friday, and then the Saturday we took them all in the bus to our local community where they were hosted. Um, then the students were taken with their families, and we said to them, just, just invite them to be part of your family. And what we would like you to do is, you know, if whatever you do on a Saturday morning, you know, expo let, the, let, you, let those students be part of your family. Don't change what you normally do, because what we would like to, the students to do is to experience what it's like for you in your families and your communities. And then I met, we met again on Sunday. We had, um, they all go to church, and then we have a Sunday lunch, um, and we have a debrief on the Monday. So the community as educators, the community has a very important role in this, and this is my belief in terms of engaging the community in the work of the university. 
And as I mentioned before, uh, we ask the community to share with the students what is important to them, particularly when they come to see them in their health professions. So in terms of some of the feedback from the students, um, in terms of the objectives of the program, the students felt that when they came in into the, into the host families, that they were very welcoming. Uh, one of the students said to me, oh, I'm really scared to go into the Pacific home because all I see is what I see in the news and it's mostly bad news. And after the, the immersion program, um, their eyes were open to the fact that, you know, our communities and the way that we engage with one another has a positive impact on health. In terms of experiencing what it is that influences health in the social economic environment, I, I teach the medical students right from second year until um, their final year at university. And the, the light didn't go, you know, in their head, it didn't, the light bulb didn't go on until they were actually exposed and, and engaged with our local community. The practice cross-cultural communication. I have come to realize that quality communication is an underestimated health determinant. I always knew that communication was important, especially when patients do not speak English. A translator may be necessary. However, there is a lot more to communication than just speaking the same language. What these students have found is that they came away feeling that they can contribute and that they, they, can, they can improve um, the health of our communities when they're out there because they now have experienced what it's like to be engaged with the local community and to be within the context of families. And lastly, I've heard repeatedly in lectures how different aspects of Pacific culture could affect the delivery of health care but I wasn't sure how true it was for the average Pacific Islander. This skepticism evaporated when I listened to my host father describe his people and their relationship with doctors. So what has happened since then is some of the students, when they see, um, you know, when the families go into the hospital now, those that have had the immersion program, the students come up to them and say hello. And it's been a really, fantastic engagement between these medical students who are learning how to engage with our local community. So initially it was offered as an optional program, but now because it's been so successful and both the students, our community and our staff feel that it's an important part of training, it has now become part, a compulsory part of medical education at Otago. So this is some of the feedback that we got from the students, that they felt that this experience has given them confidence to work not only with our communities, but also across cultures. And this is one of the really important things in terms of getting the teaching of Pacific culture into the medical education training, and not only medicine, but also looking at other health professional courses in physiotherapy, pharmacy, and so on. One of the things that's really important for students is that if something is not assessed, they don't consider it as important. So not only is the Pacific Immersion Program become a compulsory part of medical training at the University of Otago, but is there also formal assessment of um, that, what, what it is that they've learned from this education. So what is the lessons learned? that there is a need for cultural training for all health professionals in New Zealand, not only in Otago, in Auckland as well, and in nursing and training institutions. There is a need for that, while we're still um, trying to train our own health professional students. The Pacific communities have a vital role in the training of doctors. And one of the ideas behind this is that, um, that our communities tell um, these young people about what's important to them. Um, so they not only when they go to the local hospital that will benefit them, but when they go out to other areas in New Zealand and train, they will have some understanding of, our, of the context for our Pacific people. 
that it's, this immersion program has provided a unique opportunity for medical students to learn about Pacific Health. And some of them said, well, I just lived down the door from the person that I went and stayed with, but I didn't realize how so different it was for them. And I feel so guilty that me, as a student, can go back to my own home, which was much more comfortable than the family that I stayed with. That there is a need to develop a proper assessment of, of uh, tools for learning in knowledge, attitudes, and skills. And that this program has developed a closer relationship between the University of Otago and the local community. It's a very empowering um, for our local community to have these young doctors come into our, to their homes. But there's also one thing that I had secretly in the back of my mind. It's normalizing um, you know, the idea of going into university, even though the university is really in the doorsteps. Um, but a lot of them don't actually think that they can actually walk into the context of the university. So having these students come in and live in their homes, I would love to see these young ones who are engaging with them and having a chat with these young students think that, yeah, it might be okay for me to go to university, that it's not such a, that these students are, are normal, they're not from out somewhere in Mars, that they're just like people like me and you. So not only is it an idea in terms of teaching the medical students about understanding or have some understanding of working with our communities, the idea also is for our young ones to think, yeah, I think it's doable for me. I mean, they look quite normal, they have fun, so maybe it's okay for me to do that as well, to go to nursing and to go to medical training. So for those of you, we would love um, you know, to have your young people Come, we will look after young people. If you would like to come to the University of Otago, come and talk to me. Um, we will look at providing pathways for you. And, and please remember that health professional training is not just dentistry and medicine. Um, there's also a wealth of a whole lot of, lot of other health professional courses that you can get into. Faftai lava molevanoa, and I will hand it now to you. Um, I was uh, luckily, um, lucky enough to uh, be chosen to present on behalf of the team. So apologies to my team if I don't do them justice in this presentation um, and that it doesn't reflect all the hard work that's gone in there. Um, I'm hoping that my uniform that everyone has complimented me on um, will kind of take the attention away from what's on the screen. Um, <laughs> During the presentation, I might just swing this way and that way, <laughs> just to make sure that you're still awake. So for some people um, that we've met during the past couple of days, they've asked us, um, who is Leva? And as, uh, if you were here yesterday, you would have heard Monique say that four years ago was when Leva was officially launched. Um, and in that time, our role has evolved. So LEVAR is New Zealand's Pacific Workforce Development and National Coordination Service for Mental Health, Addictions and Disability. Our priority areas include growing the Pacific workforce. It also includes supporting the mainstream workforce to be more responsive to the needs of our communities. And it's about improving services for all New Zealanders. So again, this is about looking at solutions that are just not just about Pacific for Pacific, but how can we ensure that our solutions work for all New Zealanders. So what I'm going to talk about today is um, just to compliment on um, what Tay has already spoken about. So in terms of the work that, what we, the work that we've been doing um, at LEVAR around growing the Pacific workforce, um, on behalf of the Ministry of Health, we manage the um, Pacific Mental Health and Addiction Scholarships and also the Pacific Health Workforce Awards. So over the last four years that we've been managing both awards and scholarships, we've allocated over 600 scholarships and awards uh, to Pacific people studying a health-related qualification. Now that's a significant investment, particularly when you're thinking about um, the cost of medical um, course fees, which right now is anything between 14 to 15,000. So that 600 of our students have benefited from these scholarships and awards. Um, we've had uh, a huge focus uh, from this government on priority workforce groups, and they include medicine, nursing, oral health, midwifery, podiatry, psychology, OT, and the rest are on the, on, on the screen. We also run a leadership program, and over 50 people have participated in our Leto Tour Emerging Leadership Program. 
We also have, to date, we've got about 11 who are currently in our alumni program. So again, we're starting to see some development and some involvement in um, some of our leaders starting to come through. It was good to hear from Ezra this morning where he said um, what people would have felt yesterday, the buzz that was coming through is about an emergence of new leadership. And just one thing I want to correct is that um, many of these people have always been in the sector. Um, so they didn't just pop in overnight, you know, they suddenly became leaders. They've kind of always been there and they've been kind of just doing their work, carrying on doing what they've been doing under the radar. And the opportunity has, is, is, it's kind of right now. And so they've stepped up to the challenge that Levar put out to them to um, turn up to this forum and to take a lead role and provide some key messages around where we're going to go in the future. So over um, some of the other work that we've been doing around growing the Pacific workforce include over 500 Pacific people working within disability support services have been recipients of training and leadership development grants that have been administered by our TAPO Disability Workforce Development Team. So for those of you who aren't aware or familiar about that information, the guides in our team, Rob and Ben, you need to um, follow up with them and talk to members of our Favour Aura National Leadership Group. We have a strong database of students and key stakeholders, which today is at 1,600, but it's growing by the minute, by the day. So some of the things that I'm going to talk about now um, is not new, so we all know it. So the challenges for growing the Pacific workforce include um, there are multiple players that are occupying the same space. And we're not just talking about our own Pacific people. We've got non-Pacific in there, we've got mainstream, we've got Māori in there doing work for Pacific as well. There's a lack of good understanding around career pathways and career plans. So it was interesting to hear what the Minister was saying today. It's a common thing for a lot of our students. They're choosing a lot of different subjects, um, choose, and taking a lot of credits, but they're not necessarily the right credits that they need when they choose the qualification at tertiary level, if they're lucky to even get to entry into tertiary. There's a lack of robust information systems. I think we have a government now that's asking us to measure, um, to show the impact of our work, and yet we haven't actually had information systems in place to enable us to do that. So it's a little wonder that um, we kind of have this big challenge um, that there isn't any information in, in there to show that things are working or capturing the impact of our work. There's a misalignment between local, regional and national needs. So we're hearing from uh, some of our uh, local communities and our local students around things that are, are prior to them. But as they come up through the levels through regional and through national, their voice kind of gets lost. And so we need to look at how we make sure that there is a forum that allows us to get some alignment going through uh, local, regional and national. There's a lot of fragmentation and duplication. And it's not, again, I need to emphasize, it's not just about our work, it's because of the multiple players that are occupying the same space, that's what's causing the fragmentation and the duplication. And of course, this government has created a lovely competitive environment for us. So it actually makes it very difficult for us to, look, to work collaboratively together. But I think that's a challenge for our sector is how do we still become competitors but still work collaboratively? Um, one of the top points that I noted up there um, is what we found over the years in managing awards and scholarships is that financial support is not enough. So we're putting a lot of um, investment and a lot of our uh, tertiary co um, education colleagues would be able to um, confirm this as well. We're putting a lot of um, investment into providing financial support and then we're leaving our students there to try and figure out um, where do they go to get their support, how do they complete their studies, who do they go to. And the worst thing we find is that many of them end up failing. And so what we want to make sure is that we avoid that. So it has to be more than just financial support. It's about putting together a whole um, support mechanism in place for our students. Opportunities to connect have been scarce. And that's probably what the value of GPS has provided, is that it's, we've looked beyond health. So we've looked at social sectors, education, and how do we start to bring people together we can actually have the same common outcomes for our Pacific people. So over the last four years, and through discussions with many of our colleagues in the sector, what are some key learnings that we found um, that we needed to um, learn from for a Pacific solution? 
Well, the important one is don't duplicate what already exists. You know, if it's not broken, broken don't try and fix it. Um, put in place a solution that meets a need. Um, again, don't come in there with a solution when you're unclear about what the need is. Partner with stakeholders that can demonstrate sound evidence base that is sustainable, that has high quality delivery and is like-minded. And again, um, we're not saying you just pick one. You need to, if you're going to go shopping for a provider, make sure they can tick off all four boxes because you're going to need them to be able to hold their own when the going gets tough. Make sure you collect the right information. So the important thing we needed to think about is um, how do we look beyond the little space that we're in. And if we're wanting to collect information about growing the workforce, how are we connecting with the education sector? How are we connecting with employers to make sure that as our students come in, they choose the right qualification, they complete their qualification on time, that there's a job waiting there for them. So it's important that we make sure that we're collecting that information so that we can ensure that the discussions that we have with key stakeholders around jobs um, will ensure that the right jobs are waiting for them. Um, the biggest key learning for us is status quo is not an option. So how things have been um, happening lately, we just can't continue with that. We've got to make a change. Um, I just wanted to put a slide up because Ty had a slide with had numbers, so I thought I'd do the same. <laughs> um, these are the awards that we've allocated. Uh, these are just the Pacific Health Workforce Awards. Uh, that we've allocated over the last four, uh, four years. So as you'll see, um, if you can see, it starts from right to left in terms of 2009 will be on your right and 2012 is, is green on your left. So we're seeing a steady increase in the priority workforce groups for the ministry and for this government, which is actually um, interesting. So it, things are happening. What you won't see in this graph, but which we can see at our end, is that a significant proportion of these people are new. So they're not necessarily the same people that are um, going through through first year of um, funding, second year, third year. Um, these are just people in their groups, but within them, we're finding new students every year. So this year, almost 50% of our students that we're funding have never been funded through an award scheme or a scholarship before. Um, so they are plenty of students out there. We're just trying to now figure out how we can try and catch them and collect some data on them and more importantly start to support them. So this was our solution. It's actually our Future Set Work program. And um, what I'll do is I'm just going to talk um, very briefly about the plan. It's actually quite a big lengthy plan. It's an action plan that has lots and lots of boxes. Um, I try to cut it down to just the three key com um, components for you um, and also include in there who our partners for this program are. So the overall outcome for um, the Future Set Work program, it's about a more qualified and competent Pacific Health workforce who are well connected with Pacific communities. And um, over the last couple of days you would have heard if we're going to change the health system, we need to make sure that people who reflect who we are are in key decision-making roles at the top. So we need to make sure that the workforce that we're growing is connected to our communities. Otherwise, we're, enc we're encouraging a disconnect with our, uh, within our own communities. So the three key points for Futures at Work are get your fees paid. So this is the work that, um, in addition to the Ministry of Health, who's also a key partner for us, this is the funding that they provide for us to offer 100% of your course health fees paid. So that's, again, significant when you're doing qualifications like medicine, um, like nursing. And again, it was, it was lovely for Ty to acknowledge that there are more than just doctors and nurses out there. I'd like to advocate for lawyers. They're also helpful, particularly when there's malpractice, but um, I'll just add that there. Um, so get your fees paid is 100% of your course fees. Um, no one else offers that. This is something that we want to offer to our Pacific students through this program. I want to emphasise that this whole program does exactly what the Minister talked about this morning. It's about setting high expectation for our students, for our communities and for our families. Part of your Get Your Fees Paid includes terms and conditions for being on this program. One of them is about giving back to our Pacific communities. So for those who've been around in the sector for a while, a lot of the funding that, go, that sits behind some of the Pacific Health Workforce Awards 
um, was actually a fund driven by our Pacific communities. So it's very important that we ensure that a program like this does include a give back to them. Some of our students that we found out are not as well connected to, it, to their communities, and a program like this is what we want to ensure can facilitate that. Um, the second part is about getting your study sorted. Um, and this is about trying to put in place a really strong support service mechanism for all of our students in the program. So many of our um, education colleagues might go, oh, but we're already doing that at tertiary institutions. What we want to try and do here is how do we look beyond just the region that we're in. So we, um, a lot of the resources that we'll make available to our students is actually going to be ma uh, made available online. So they're going to be able to check in and use these resources, which, which will not be just limited to the tertiary institution that they are attending. It's a range of resources nationally and internationally that are going to be helpful for them. So the difference with our Get Your Study Sorted program, it's, a, it's really about a coaching program that's focusing on developing key skills. These are key skills around how you can ensure that you will advance and complete on time and how you transition into the workforce. And that's really important for a lot of our students as they choose their first year um, of qualification. Not many of them are starting to think about have they actually got the right career plan or have they, are they on the right career pathway. And I think what we need to do is how do we ensure that that information is accessible for them to start thinking about that. I think gone are the days for those of us who went to uni and you could just fluff around and do what you want. Now um, we're in a bit of a competitive environment and jobs are at a premium. So we need to ensure that through a program like this, we can ensure supply meets demand. So if there's a job waiting for you and someone has, um, and we've got employers who are saying, well, we've got these service priorities, we have these service needs, we're looking for health workers in these particular areas, then through this program we can ensure that those that are coming through, one, that we're profiling that there are these jobs available, two, that we are targeting people who can transition into that career pathway, even if they haven't chosen them, can they transition into that career pathway? I think we need to start thinking about the end outcome. Is there a job there and can they go into that job? Um, as I said before, around a lot of these um, resources that we're going to make available online, um, they will also include um, resources or video clips from our connectors. So um, there's just a little picture down there. I'll just point. <laughs> a picture down there um, that shows our uh, connectors. So we have two lots of our connectors. Uh, they're both student connectors and clinical connectors. And our student connectors are really there to ensure that we keep our finger on the pulse around what are the needs for our Pacific students. They're there to ensure that our program is fit for purpose um, and that our program adapts to the needs. So um, what we put in place today may not necessarily meet their needs in a year's time. So how do we ensure that this program is adaptive? We've got our clinical connectors involved as well, and Jeremy Stanley was talking yesterday. He's one of our clinical connectors. Um, just because he's based in Auckland, um, by having some online uh, resources and clips of him, he'll be able to share his messages with everybody else in, around New Zealand and internationally as well. So again, it's trying to think beyond the parameters of um, Auckland, um, or if you're in Otago, or if you're in Wellington, how do we ensure you're getting the right information to make some informed decisions about your career choice? We're also partnering up with Careers in Z in doing the Get Your Study Sorted program. Um, and we chose Careers in Z because this is actually what they're supposed to be doing. Um, and like I said before, we were very keen to make sure that we don't duplicate what already exists. The challenge for us is to actually make the system work and by doing that, we've got to identify the partners that we need to work with. So Careers NZ, it's great to have Careers NZ on board. We'll be working with them to develop an online skills assessment tool. And so that, that will be made available to all of our scholarship and award recipients. We've also been working in partnership, as Ty said, with Otago University, both their Otago and their Wellington campus. And again, they'll be, we'll be working together to ensure that there's a good connection back to our communities, that solutions that are working at a local level can be applied or adapted at a national level. 
The third bit, which um, is about get your dream job. Again, this is about ensuring that there is a job waiting for our students. I think as a parent, um, I'd be quite disheartened for my child if she worked really hard to complete her studies and get some good grades just to find that she couldn't get a job. Um, so again, it's just trying to make sure that supply can meet demand and that we don't have too many people trying to choose uh, to be doctors or too many people trying to choose be, to be nurses. Again, what we're looking for is that quality health care requires a multidisciplinary team. And so we need to have a huge range of people choosing a wide range of career choices. Um, we've partnered, our partners in the Get Your Dream Job, the Get Your Dream Job, um, include Auckland DHB and Capital Coast DHB. So they have cadetship programs, internship programs, graduate programs in place. So what we're trying to offer for our students is how do they get into those programs so that they get access to work experience. So we will be familiar with um, students saying uh, that they weren't successful in a job because they didn't have adequate work experience. And what we're doing is by connecting through programs that already exist and have shown to work, that we can at least overcome that barrier. We're also going to try and support our students to get into jobs. So those that don't require a clinical placement component, we're going to look at how we can make sure that you go into the right job. So it's not just any job, we need you to go into the, the workforce and stay in the workforce. So it's about making sure that there's a right match with the right employer for you. I think Enid just gave me a hint that that was um, full time. <laughs> um, okay, key messages. So from our presentation, um, what are some of the key messages that we'd like you to go away with? Well, one is growing a Pacific workforce requires integrated partnerships. So it's more than just about saying you want to work together, it's about actually doing it. Um, and it's more than just about working within our own, and more than just working just with health or just within, within education. We've got to work across the sectors. Um, we need to look at how the wider workforce engages effectively with our communities. And as Ty said, the majority of um, people who are involved enrolled with a non-Pacific provider is far bigger than those that are enrolled with the Pacific provider. So again, we've got to ensure that um, the needs of our communities are being met by whoever is delivering the service. Our own Pacific um, professionals, and um, it is much wider than just health professionals, need to have a clear understanding of their leadership potential and responsibilities. So all of us, in our own little, in little role, um, actually have a role to our communities to ensure that we can um, contribute to improving outcomes. <coughs> on that note, I will say, so on behalf of um, Dr. Fafite Sopoanga and myself, uh, thank you for listening to us today. Soi forma i manuia.